Hello, my name is Andrew Gary, and welcome to Seismic Sound Off in depth conversations in applied geophysics. Listeners, we want to hear from you about why you love geophysics. Why did you choose geophysics? What do you love about the science and the work you do? We want to highlight as many of your stories in future episodes, so please email us your answers at podcast at seg.org or leave us a message with your story at country code 1 918 497 4627. SEG held its 86th annual meeting in Dallas in October 2016. On the first day of the meeting, SEG's president, John Bradford, addressed a large crowd for the SEG opening session and presidential address. Dorsey Morrow, SEG's executive director, opened the session and introduced John Bradford. We are happy to bring you Dorsey Morrow and President John Bradford's talk in its entirety. Please stay with us. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 86th annual meeting for the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. Again, my name is Dorsey Morrow, and it is my honor to serve as executive director for SEG. I first want to acknowledge and recognize our volunteers because it's on our volunteers that SEG is able to do what it's able to do. I mean, it's, we, we provide a lot of information and tools for geoscientists around the world. From our lecturers to editors, from our uh, committee members to our board members, every one of them is committed to delivering the very best for SEG. And I just want to personally thank all of our volunteers. And I would certainly be remiss if I did not commend to you the SEG staff. It's certainly been my pleasure to work with them over the past year and a half. And frankly, I've never worked with a society with staff members so dedicated to delivering the very best day in and day out to the membership. Our focus is making sure we give you the very best. As was mentioned a little earlier this morning, it's a rough market. I don't think that's overselling it. I don't think that's a secret either. Some things just don't work out the way you plan or the way you hope. So what do you do? You adapt. You improvise. You persevere. SEG is focused, even in the midst of this storm, on delivering the very best tools and information that we possibly can to you, our membership. And so what I wanted to take a few minutes today was to talk about those tools and what we're delivering, what we've done this past year for our membership. We are really excited. I think uh, you will be excited as well once we kind of walk through them. First off is our logo. I don't know, um, have we got uh, something on the screen? We changed our logo this year. After consulting with members from around the globe, graphic artists, consultants, we came away with something that we thought was bright, clean, crisp, recognized who we are and what we're doing. By the same token, we also updated our website. Our website, well, I'm sorry, this is our our app. I'll go ahead and talk about this then first. I hope, for those of you that have smartphones, I hope that you have downloaded our event app. Our meetings team has gone to great lengths to put together an app that tells you what's going on, when it's going on, where, uh, provide you with notes, information, social media, uh, locators for the various events. It's a great app, and I I hope you utilize it to its fullest. Now, I think our next slide, well, no, we've... Let me talk about our our website. (laughs) I've been very pleased with it. Our IT team basically took our old old website down and scrapped it. We rebuilt the SEG website from the ground up. We wanted it to be like the logo. We wanted it to be clean, very easy to navigate, um, easily searchable, getting you to what you want in a timely manner. It's also a responsive website. Unlike our old website, no matter what tool you're using to view the website, whether it's a laptop, desktop, uh, your iPad, smartphone, whatever it may be, it adjusts so that it has the same look and feel, easier to navigate on that particular device. Our knowledge management team has put together a number of products. 
This one we launched uh, a little over a month ago, the SEG Smart Brief. It's just a quick email every morning that you get in your inbox that gives you nuggets about what's going on in the geoscience industry. Knowledge Management Team has also developed GeoFacets, providing access to over 14,000 maps by combining articles from SEG publications and combining them with Elsevier maps, providing unprecedented geological insight across the globe for the explorationists. This is something that is free for our members for 2016 and a greatly reduced rate for 2017. We're really proud of this partnership. Not to be outdone is our programs department led by Dr. Tom Agnew. Uh, SEG On Demand, this is our learning center. We've updated it just like the website to make it easy to navigate, find the courses that you're interested in, and the way that you're interested in learning them. It's a, a fantastic site for just about anybody wanting to find the latest information. Again, this is driven by our volunteers providing this, this uh, cutting edge information. Here's something that we're unveiling at the annual meeting. This is our career management system. This basically allows you to assess your capabilities against specific competency models in various geoscience careers. In other words, you take the exam and it tells you where you stand against these models, identifies those gaps, tells you how to close those gaps, and where to find the information, the training that you need to close those gaps, and then tracks your progress. It's an incredible tool, particularly for the early career professional, but really anybody who is interested in bettering themselves, becoming, uh, improving themselves professionally, would do well with this. This is another free uh, service for our membership. This will be unveiled, um, and I think they're doing demos twice a day during the coffee breaks at the SEG Pavilion. Our career center, as we said, it's a tough market. This is a new service that we've done, provides uh, tips on writing a resume, uh, advice on going through an interview, uh, career advice in general, as well as opportunities to look for jobs. Um, I hope our members that are looking uh, for uh, that sort of help will avail themselves of this, uh, this uh, website. So these are some of the things that we have going. I hope that this shows you that SEG is engaged. We are working hard every day to provide you the tools and information that you need. But not just for today, we're also working hard for tomorrow. We want to engage to attract that next generation professional. We, don't, we want to serve as the center for geoscience. In short, this is your SEG. Now what I'd like to do is welcome Dr. John Bradford, our president for SEG. John earned his degrees in uh, engineering and uh, physics uh, from University of Kansas. John, I always have trouble with Kansas and Kentucky, but um, University of Kansas. He earned his PhD in geophysics from Rice University and is currently professor of geophysics at Boise State. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Bradford. Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I appreciate uh, you being here for the uh, annual meeting this year. A um, couple of things that I would like to do. First on my title slide here, you see the uh, B logo here, and I need to acknowledge my uh, sponsor, Boise State University, my employer, who has uh, given me a, a leave of uh, a teaching uh, release this year so that I could uh, focus on the job uh, that is required of the president. Um, I wanted to uh, point out one more thing. Um, so the staff this year, I think, anytime you see a staff member, you really need to thank them because they have done more with a lot less this year uh, than ever before. Uh, and even though the
times are difficult. Uh, as Dorsey showed, and I'll show some more, uh, they've been able to uh, release some new products and continue to advance our efforts to uh, improve the services that we provide to the members. So who are we? SEG is dedicated to advancing the science of applied geophysics and fostering scientific interest of geophysicists. This has been our mission from day one. Um, and that's going to be the theme that I try to link throughout the, uh, throughout the talk and my comments. Um, but the face that we present to the outside world first, right, is uh, through our brand. And Dorsey mentioned this, but why did we really see a need to change our branding? Well, uh, over the years, so many logos had uh, been developed, it was difficult uh, oftentimes with our products to, to even recognize that SEG was, uh, was within it. So this is you know, a number, not even all, uh, of the logos and various items that we had uh, in the past advertise our products. And uh, so the idea was to simplify that and uh, make a logo that was very simple, clean, and modern, and then use that throughout all of our, uh, uh, all of our um, programs and activities that we were doing. And we also uh, have a new tagline, connecting the world of applied geophysics. So one thing that we felt was important and something that we'll be working on in the future is really modernizing uh, and improving our communications. And this uh, tagline captures that idea. Uh, Dorsey mentioned the website. You couldn't find your slide, but I have one here, fortunately. So <laughs> I won't belabor the point, but uh, I, would, I would add to Dorsey's comments that uh, uh, the website was uh, sort of a, a pain in the side of many members for a number of years, and everyone had been uh, really looking forward to uh, this launch, and we appreciate the staff uh, working so hard to get it out this year. Okay, so what are our priorities within this context? Well, we serve a global membership. Uh, so our count this year is 27,000 members, and you may note that it's different than last year's count, which was around 33,000. And I, I want to make sure that uh, any of you who recognize that difference is not alarmed. Uh, we didn't lose 6,000 members this year. Uh, but what the staff did was uh, improve their accounting processes, and it's a more accurate count. So our numbers are down a little bit, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but not by that much. Um, so our members are in 128 countries. Uh, we have members uh, and uh, in sections and associated societies, 52 different uh, of those. And we have 357 student chapters, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, another thing that, uh, that we've done this year is improve our ability to, uh, uh, to measure those uh, members uh, and identify where they are and, and uh, what kinds of members they are. So the plot that I'm showing here, the map that I'm showing here, uh, shows you uh, where, uh, where the members reside, and then blue shows student member, or, sorry, blue shows active members, orange shows uh, associate members, and green shows uh, student members. So you can see the distribution, uh, both in the numbers and what types of members they are uh, throughout the world. And of course, uh, through our offices uh, in China and the, and uh, the Middle East, we serve uh, other areas where we have uh, large populations of members, um, and we serve that global population in a number of ways, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of those. So through the uh, Distinguished Instructor Short Course, which is a, a global tour, um, this year's Distinguished Instructor is uh, Jim Geyser, and he's uh, visited uh, seven different countries and made uh, 11 stops for his tour this year. And next year will be uh, Doug Oldenburg, and uh, the year after that will be uh, Kurt Marfert. And then uh, we also have the Honorary Lecture and Distinguished Lecture uh, Series, um, so uh, in 2016, Joe Dellinger and uh, Steve Constable were the uh, distinguished lecturers, and uh, Mike Kemperer, Pedro Alvarez, Saeed Maruki, uh, Scott Mitchell, Hao Wei Chen, and Xi Zhang were the uh, honorary lecturers. Uh, but this is one of the most effective tools that we have for reaching to our members uh, globally. Uh, and between these two lecture tours, we reach about 10,000, or we've reached about 10,000 members this year. So roughly double the uh, number of people that are at the, uh, at the annual meeting here. So very effective. And Dorsey mentioned a couple of uh, new communications tools, but we're really working hard to try and advance uh, our communications tools so we can more effectively reach that uh, global membership. Um, and a lot of that depends on using modern communications. For example, the Smart Brief, and I don't know if 
you've looked at this. I think there are about 5,000 people who opted in to receive the smart brief. Uh, I read it every morning, and I think it's a, I think it's a really excellent, nice way to get a, a quick update of what's going on uh, in our profession. We also have uh, the seismic sound off. I think Sarah mentioned this. So this is the new uh, podcast series, and this uh, this talk that I'm giving right now is going to be available on the uh, seismic sound off uh, in the near future. Uh, but there are a number of different uh, topics that are covered with this. Okay, so um, we advance applied geophysics by communicating more effectively with our members, uh, but we also do that uh, with some of our core programs. Um, one of those, of course, is the uh, annual meeting. And uh, so at the, this year's annual meeting, we have uh, over 5,000 attendees, and uh, it's a little bit uh, smaller in attendees than in past conferences, which I think is not too uh, big of a surprise, but it's a bigger number than we were expecting, so we're very, uh, very happy with that. Uh, we don't have 2,500 exhibitors. You might note that that's a typo. We have about 250 exhibitors on the floor, which is a good number, and I don't know if you've been on the exhibit floor yet or if you came to the icebreaker, but that was, uh, uh, I think the exhibit floor looks great. Um, and we also do a number of collaborative events around the, uh, around the world, and you'll recognize some of these that we've been doing for a long time, like uh, NAEP and OTC and ERTEC, and these are all done in, in collaboration with other organizations. There are a couple of new things that I wanted to point out. Uh, CPEX, the Society, uh, or the, sorry, the Southeast Asia Petroleum Exploration Society, so we formed a new partnership with uh, CPEX this year and are uh, going to partner with them uh, for their event in Singapore uh, in April. And uh, we've also worked really hard to develop uh, a better relationship with IAGC, the International Association of Geophysical Contractors. And I just wanted to note that in February at uh, the IAGC, um, at the IAGC annual meeting, they will be awarding uh, SEG with the President's uh, Excellent Award. So we're very, uh, very pleased with that. And uh, Bill Abriel, the President-elect, will be there to accept that award on behalf of SEG. Uh, another piece of our core, uh, our core products, how we deliver uh, technical content, excellent technical content to the members, is through our publications. So of course we have our main uh, communications vehicle, the leading edge, uh, geophysics and interpretation are our peer-reviewed journals, uh, and of course we have our series of reference uh, books and uh, a big collection of uh, e-books now as well. Uh, there are a couple of things that I wanted to mention about, uh, about each one. So uh, last year we launched the TLE app, and I don't know if you use it, but I use the TLE app on my iPhone, and that's the only way I, I read it now. The app is, is really an excellent tool. Um, geophysics. So geophysics are our uh, uh, oldest and uh, premier a peer-reviewed journal, reached its highest impact factor in, in uh, the journal's history. We reached a value of over two, and for us in academia, this is really uh, a critical measure of the quality of the journal, uh, and it's an important uh, number and a, and a good accomplishment to have reached that. We also had a record number of papers published this year, so it'll be 413 papers published in geophysics this year, which is 87 more uh, than the previous high. Uh, our journal uh, interpretation, so this was launched as a joint uh, publication with AAPG in 2013. Uh, this year, it received its first impact factor. Uh, and uh, what's really notable about this is how soon after the launch of the journal that it actually uh, received the impact factor uh, that it has. So this is a, an excellent accomplishment for this journal. Uh, and we have about 5,000 SEG members who uh, subscribe to interpretation. Um, another piece of our, our core business is in professional development. This is another way that we deliver uh, technical content to our members. Uh, and there's the, a new product, and I think uh, Dorsey mentioned this, the competency management system in his talk. But this is a way that uh, members can go in, do a self-evaluation of the skills uh, that they have, uh, and also receive some feedback on what uh, skills they, that might be useful for them to improve if they want to make... Uh, uh, some advances in their career. Uh, another tool that we have is the uh, on-demand, the SEG on-demand platform. 
And uh, in the SEG On Demand platform, there's access to the entire library of SEG um, uh, content, uh, digital content, and uh, users can go in, view that content, build a personal page that uh, keeps track of what they have uh, viewed and their, and their uh, uh, online educational activities so that they have a, a good assessment of um, what they've been doing and, and what they need to do in the future. Um, another uh, way that we work uh, to deliver uh, excellent technical content is through our uh, subsidiary corporation, the, the research corporation, SEAM. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the new SEAM project, which is upcoming, which is uh, titled The Life of Field. And the idea behind this project is to uh, fully model and simulate a reservoir in all its uh, and all the aspects of that, so including the uh, engineering, the geology, how things change through time, through the full life of a field, as it suggests, but a fully integrated project that integrates all the disciplines and data that we need to do uh, work in the way that it's done uh, 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 that it's done nowadays. Uh, so, of course, I need to recognize all of the uh, corporate partners who have participated in SEAM uh, over the years. Finally, what's really critical is uh, inspiring the geoscientists to mar of tomorrow, and we do that in a number of ways. Um, we currently had, uh, have, as I mentioned, 357 student chapters in 67 countries, and you can see the distribution of those chapters here. Um, it's really great to see, and I think a testament to the excellent uh, student programs that, uh, that we have, that every board meeting we're approving two, three, four, five new student chapters. So students around the world are really excited about the student programs that we have. That gets them very interested in SEG. Um, and, you know, through formation of student chapters, hopefully we begin uh, developing the next generation of leaders for SEG as well. Um, EPIC, so EPIC was a new committee formed last year that's the Emerging Professionals International Committee. And, and to me, this was sort of SEG working at its best or how we can, uh, how our membership can function at its best. So this was uh, formed initially by a group of students who had come through uh, SEG student programs. And when they made this transition into their uh, professional careers, they felt there was a, a bit of a gap. So they got together, um, came up with some ideas and decided to form this new committee to try and help uh, SEG grow its, uh, uh, grow its programming and, and activities for uh, uh, emerging or early career professionals. Um, and of course, I would like to thank all of uh, the sponsors, the corporate sponsors, who help us uh, put together all of these uh, student and early career programs. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the uh, Women's uh, Networking Committee. Uh, a number of accomplishments uh, this year. So uh, Sally Zinke was the first SEG president in uh, 2000, uh, first woman, uh, woman SEG president in 2000. Um, and uh, up to this year was the only SEG uh, woman president, which I think is uh, a serious, uh, indicates a serious issue within our organization. And so this year, uh, two of the uh, women on the Women's Networking Committee, Nancy House and Anna Shaughnessy, ran for president, and Nancy House uh, won that election, and Nancy House, uh, our president-elect-elect, elect, is here with us today. Uh, but great to see that we'll have uh, another woman president, and I think that we should not uh, be so far, uh, so many years before we have another one uh, the next time. Uh, there's something that, so I have uh, some of the demographics here. You can see uh, the number of women versus men uh, in the organization and how that decreases uh, as, as uh, we get to the more senior people. And this more or less reflects the situation in our profession overall. Um, but I think as an organization, uh, SEG, we don't have to uh, pure, just merely reflect what's happening uh, in the profession outside of SEG, but we can take a leadership role and make sure that uh, women are being advanced into leaders, leadership positions within SEG, uh, advanced for awards, and uh, uh, we can take a more uh, proactive role in this regard. Uh, also last year, we reorganized the way that our near-surface technical section was, um, was being administered, uh, but this has turned out to be quite effective. 
So uh, this here you can see the membership, and it had reached uh, an all-time low in 2013, but the membership uh, for a near-surface group has been growing dramatically since that time. And finally, uh, another way that we can uh, inspire the next generation of geoscientists and geophysicists is showing the social contribution of, of what geophysicists do. And a beautiful example of that is Geoscientists Without Borders, which is a program that uh, SEG runs and is sponsored through um, the SEG Foundation. So it's focused on humanitarian applications of geophysics. Uh, so far, there's been 29 projects in 23 different countries, and many of those are focused on uh, groundwater problems. And of course, we'd like to thank the uh, corporate sponsors who uh, helped keep uh, G uh, GWB running. And uh, I would like to give a big thanks to the SEG Foundation and the SEG Foundation Board. So this is a, a group of very dedicated volunteers who put in a lot of time to raise funds to support all of the programs that, uh, or many of the programs that SEG uh, puts on. Uh, we have many different corporate sponsors who help keep the foundation going and help support all of the programs within SEG. Finally, uh, what I'm going to spend uh, the rest of the time on is, is more a discussion about uh, engaging in sustainable business practices, and I'm really looking primarily towards the future. Uh, so this is the current uh, SEG board of directors, and this is really where the ultimate responsibility for making sure that we're engaging in a sustainable business lies. Um, so this year, uh, we have several people rolling off the board, and I want to give them a big thanks. So Eve Sprunt, uh, Allison Small, Chris Liner, um, Guillaume Cambois, and Gustavo Carstens. So these are uh, board members who have put in a lot of time over the last two to three years, uh, a huge amount of time and a huge amount of effort particularly in the, in the uh, difficult times that we're having, and I think they uh, deserve a big thanks. So if you see them, give them, a, give them a handshake and a pat on the back. But they're leaving us, and our new board members uh, are here. So Nancy House, who I mentioned, uh, President-elect, Madeline Lee, second vice president, who I think I saw back here. Lee Bell might be here in the audience somewhere. Uh, Ruben Martinez, I think, is over here. And uh, Paul Cunningham are our new uh, board members. Okay, so we know that the world is changing around us, um, and uh, I think that even before the uh, downturn in the oil industry began, we recognized that there were some uh, issues with the way that SEG was operating, some problems, and that perhaps we could run uh, a little bit more effectively. So I'm going to talk about, uh, about that, but let's Let's do that first uh, by taking a look at the current business environment and how it's impacted SEG. So what I'm showing here, the green line shows uh, the WTI uh, oil price. Blue line shows uh, the North American rig count. And uh, you can see the, the uh, crash there quite clearly about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, and then with about a two-month delay, uh, the rig count started to go down. And uh, I had been trying to find a good measure of uh, how this was impacting the SEG finances. The purple line shows the SEG cash reserves. So during good times, uh, those cash reserves are re remaining stable or, or even uh, increasing a little bit. But when times get tough, we have to start uh, utilizing those re reserves to uh, continue operating uh, SEG. And so about a year after the uh, oil price drops, you can see the, the, dro uh, the uh, drop in uh, SEG cash reserves. And this is uh, typical throughout the uh, professional organization industry when there's a, a downturn in the industry that supports that uh, kind of organization. Uh, about a year after that, you start to see the effect on the finances for the organization. So that's our case. You can see that it's, uh, you also see there's another little bump out there uh, towards the end of that uh, curve, which ends in September, that seems to be about a year out from a, uh, a bump in the green curve where. Uh, prices recovered a little bit uh, for a short period of time. That's purely coincidental, and uh, that is not uh, an impact. Uh, that's not a direct uh, correlation. But one of those cases where correlation doesn't uh, imply causation. Um, one of the things that we can anticipate, however, is when uh, things start to improve, there's going to be the same phase lag on the other side. So when things start to get better in the industry, 
Uh, it's going to be a little bit before uh, SEG sees that which means that we have to be very careful in our planning and make sure that we are operating in a sustainable way. So we made a number of adjustments this year, and uh, we are operating in a stable position right now. We are operating in a strong position, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't do better and that we don't need to uh, think carefully about how we operate in the future. Um, so this year, we uh, underwent a strategic planning uh, exercise and uh, as I said, we were thinking about this before the downturn. Uh, the downturn didn't force us to do this, but it certainly shed a different uh, light, perhaps, on it uh, as we were going through it uh, and highlighted a few areas, perhaps, that, uh, uh, that brought a little, of, uh, a little bit of extra emphasis. So back in, uh, uh, back in October of last year, we began doing some market research, surveying the members uh, to try and see where the membership uh, would like to see things going. Uh, I commissioned a task force to, uh, to work on this, which consisted of board members and a number of kit committee members. Um, and then the board, uh, we came up with a strategy. The board approved that in May, and now we're in the tactical planning phase. So if you do all the work to make a strategy, that's a lot of talk, a lot of words, and if you don't act on it, it doesn't mean anything. And we are committed to uh, acting on that to make uh, SEG a better organization. So, what brought us to the strategy? Uh, well, from the membership surveys that we did, one of the things that we found, which is not a surprise, is that what our members value the most tends to be the excellent uh, technical content that uh, SEG facilitates and provides. Um, so this comes through a number of ways, through our meetings, uh, in part through the reputation of the organization. It's recognized for excellent uh, technical material. Um, our knowledge base, of course, is our base of publications, online material, professional uh, development offer offerings, and then access to experts. So many SEG members are well-known, uh, well world-renowned experts in their fields. Uh, and if you're an SEG member, uh, you often have an, in, uh, an opportunity to interact with, uh, uh, with, these, uh, with these experts. Uh, we also asked what people saw as the growth areas for applied geophysics in the future. And there are a number of areas here in the pie chart, and I've sort of lumped them into a few uh, large pieces. So on the energy side, there's petroleum uh, reservoir management uh, and unconventional energy. So we see that uh, happening, of course, now. Um, water management and environment, those were uh, noted as important growth areas, and I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit further, uh, and also CO2 management, uh, which is related to uh, climate issues. So let's step back and take a look at the bigger picture for a moment. And I think about this in terms of grand challenges for society, and perhaps the largest that we face is the growth in population. So in 2011, we passed 7 billion people on the planet. By 2050, we're expected to reach about... Uh, 9 billion people on the planet. Um, and there are a number of major challenges that are going to arise for us um, as a society uh, from that. And in uh, geophysics, we can't uh, help with all of those, but there are certain, certainly some uh, that we can help with. So let's think for a moment about uh, what those are. So energy, of course. The energy demand of 9 billion people is enormous. And uh, at present, we don't have any way to meet that energy demand uh, without relying heavily on oil and gas. And so we anticipate that that is going to um, uh, be the case for many decades to come. You see here the chart that I'm showing, which shows the population on the, uh, in the blue curve and the uh, growth in uh, oil consumption in the red curve uh, to meet our energy supply or oil production. Those two curves are well correlated. Uh, another point that I would like to make here is what also is well correlated is quality of life and, uh, and uh, energy use. So uh, there are curves that show a similar kind of relationship uh, when you try to measure quality of life uh, relative to energy use. And uh, most of the growth that I showed, most of the population growth is coming in the developing world. So if we expect uh, everyone and feel that everyone in the world has the, the right to have a similar quality of life, uh, then we, 
need to be able to meet the uh, energy demand that's going to uh, be necessary to do that. Water. So at present, there are about 10% of the people in the world who do not have access to clean, fresh water. If we don't change our oil management practices by 2050, there are going to be about 50% of the world's population. This map that I am showing here in red shows the areas uh, of the world that are expected to be under extreme water stress by 2050. There's a quote that I put here by the uh, CEO of um, Nestle that he made in 2012. We're going to run out of water much earlier than we'll run out of oil. I expect that that's probably not true since the planet is covered with water. But to access that water and make it uh, viable for human consumption requires a lot of energy. And climate. Now, I know this is a hot-button issue, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I just wanted to read this, this uh, quote from, uh, that I pulled from the ExxonMobil webpage. The risk of climate change is clear, and the risk warrants action. Increasing carbon emissions in the atmosphere are having a warming effect. We know enough based on the research and science that the risk is real and appropriate steps should be taken to address that risk. Now, the point that I want to make with this is that, uh, you know, ExxonMobil is making statements like this. Uh, pretty much every large oil company is making statements like this. And uh, what that means for us as a profession is that, it's, uh, is that our profession is going to be engaged on this topic in a different way than it has been in the past, and this is likely to impact us as geophysicists in some way. Okay, so let's take a look uh, at some of the global energy trends, uh, and some of these are impacted, of course, by this issue of climate. Uh, so the plot that I'm showing here is from the uh, Energy Information Administration, the U.S. government agency. Um, and it's trying to uh, project what our, uh, where our energy supply is going to come from uh, over, the next, uh, over the next few decades. So the white dash line there shows where we are right now. And as we go off into the future, uh, we're expecting to continue the shift from coal to natural gas. So the U.S. Uh, peaked in about 2005 in coal use, and that's not expected to uh, come back. And largely that's driven by the economics of, uh, of gas production now. Gas is much cheaper so we can trans, uh, transition our uh, electricity supply system over to uh, gas instead of coal. Um, you also see the little wedge of, of renewables, and of course a lot of people would like to see renewables take up a much larger portion, but the reality is the economics and the technology right now just don't allow that. So to, to meet the energy demand, uh, renewables we expect to grow, uh, but it's not going to... Uh, um, grow to a point where it re takes a significant chunk out of that, and we're still going to rely heavily uh, on hydrocarbons up to that date without some major changes in technology. We're also expecting to see significant growth in unconventional. So this comes from the ExxonMobil Energy Outlook, and if you look at, so I'm showing one from EIA, I'm showing ExxonMobil's, but many uh, organizations, many companies put out these uh, energy outlooks, and they all look uh, very similar in, in all of these uh, projections. Uh, but the anticipation is that uh, conventional uh, production is going to remain flat or maybe decline a little bit, and the growth is primarily going to be on un unconventionals. And uh, so here are the last three I've highlighted all at the same time, uh, and these are more related to the climate issue. So we're anticipating there are going to be stronger regulatory requirements for uh, uh, gas, oil and gas production. Uh, there will be uh, increased subsidies for renewables, uh, we're certain of that, and there will be additional ways um, through policy to encourage CO2 capture and sequestration. Um, we know from the uh, Paris Accords last year that there are a lot of political and social pressures uh, that are driving uh, a lot of these issues and uh, driving the change of the overall energy economy, uh, and that's going to have a significant impact on our Profession. So what the, the chart that I'm showing here shows um, CO2 emissions by region. So the blue region are the uh, developed countries. And uh, we peaked uh, also between 2005 and 2010, and that's expected to continue to decrease uh, over time, and that's primarily through CO2 emissions management uh, and different uh, efficiencies. China is expected to peak in about 2030 and the world overall by around uh, uh, 2035. 
Uh, what are some of the other things that are changing that SEG needs to deal with? Well, we have demographic shifts, so we've all seen this curve. Sarah, I think, says she sits right in the middle of this, in the low spot. I'm up on the... I'm uh, up a little bit further up on that spot. I won't point out exactly where. But uh, you see, at the, at the end of this, we have a large uh, portion of our membership that's aging. And, you know, I, don't, I, I guess uh, you could think of them as sort of falling off the cliff. Maybe that's not the nicest imagery to use, but, uh, but it is, in fact, uh, something that's happening and something that we need to manage. Uh, and the other thing is that we have a large number of student members see that we drop off significantly, and we as an organization in the past have not done a particularly good job of bringing those student members into uh, and maintaining their membership as they move into uh, their professional life. Uh, this plot shows uh, some of these ideas in a somewhat different way. The one I want you to focus on is the green curve in the center there. So the green curve shows our professional membership, so our active and associate members. And this, is, uh, this, this plot is showing uh, the trend from 2012 to 2015. So really before uh, we were in the main uh, part of the downturn. And you can see that before the downturn happened even, uh, this trend was beginning where we're gradually decreasing our membership, uh, our professional membership. And that decline um, uh, appears to be coming from, or it seems likely that that decline is largely related to the aging demographic, and a lot of those folks are, uh, are retiring. Um, so if we think about trying to motivate our younger members and get them to maintain their membership, we have to consider what's important to them and, and some of the other uh, things that are going on. So through some of the surveys and some of the work that was done in preparation for the strategy, uh, we, we looked at a number of things, but some of the things that we expect is that as time goes on, we expect there to be more women in the workforce. Um, we expect the workforce to be made up more and more of people uh, outside of North America and a much larger global population in the workforce. Um, and we are also anticipating some changes in the kind of work that people are doing in the areas that applied geophysics uh, is prevalent. So. The plot down on the, on the lower right shows in purple the number of people who are employed in the oil and gas industry, number of geophysicists employ, employed in oil and gas, and clearly that's the vast majority at present, but there are some areas, because of some of the things I was talking about earlier, uh, particularly water, where we expect it to, uh, to grow. So environment and uh, groundwater, we anticipate will grow uh, in the future. Um, so what are... Uh, some of the, the uh, younger people in our profession more motivated by. And one of those things that's highlighted over and over is that they are motivated by feeling a sense of social contribution through the work that they do and the organizations that they're involved in. Uh, we all know uh, that they depend more on electronic communication than some of us uh, older folks do. Um, and they also demand easy access uh, to information in a digital way. So these are all things that we need to address uh, if we hope to maintain that, uh, uh, that demographic group and help SEG grow in the future. So just a quick uh, a matrix here to quickly sum up. Uh, some of the current challenges that we have. Oh, well, we have some challenges with sustainability that's related to uh, currently, you know, financial conditions are, are one issue that we need to deal with in sustainability, but we also have uh, in the longer term and in the bigger picture, we have our membership and trying to make sure that we continue to maintain and grow the membership in the future, which means engaging the uh, uh, early, uh, early career and emerging professionals. Um, one thing that we know is that the traditional uh, professional society model is not attractive uh, to the uh, younger generation in the same way that it was attractive uh, to some of us, and we need to uh, adapt to that. So what are some of the trends? Well, there are a lot of changes in communications technology. I think everyone recognizes that. We need to do a better job of utilizing that new technology uh, uh, to uh, communicate with our members. Globalization, I think that's an issue that uh, is continuing. SEG has been trying to manage and understand how to, how to uh, manage that situation for a number of years now, but I don't think we've totally figured out. So we need to do a better job uh, understanding uh, the global market for the kinds of uh, uh, things that we do. And uh, geophysicist jobs are changing, changing in a number of ways. So we have 
You know, the great crew change that everyone talks about, that's probably being exacerbated by the current downturn. Um, but when things start to get better, there's going to be a lot of hiring going on, and uh, we're going to get another bump in the demographic curve, uh, almost certainly. Um, so what are some of the uh, opportunities? Well, as I've mentioned, our membership most uh, heavily values the excellent technical content, the science, the, applied, the science of applied geophysics that uh, SEG helps facilitate. The social contribution of applied geophysics is very important, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, but it can be demonstrated in a number of different ways, um, and there are shifting areas of practice that uh, we need to address. Okay, so this, finally, after, at long last, this is the strategy that we landed on. Um, it could be summarized, uh, perhaps, in two words. Well, not two words, one, one short phrase, which is uh, broaden our base, focus, focus on our core. So <clears throat> the focus is on technical excellence, delivery of excellent technical material. This is SEG's strength and has been since our uh, formation. The first bullet point captures that we don't want to lose sight of what we've done well in the past and what's built us, what's brought us to this point. That's really sustaining and advancing the science of applied geophysics and resource extraction and management. The social contribution piece is the second bullet point, and there is social contribution in many ways, and I tried to highlight some of the areas that we in geophysics can uh, make social contribution. That's in energy, water, environment, uh, even in the, in, uh, on the climate side. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these things for a long time, but we, uh, as a profession, as an organization, uh, do not do a very good job of telling the world about that, of advertising the social contribution of the work that we do, and that's going to be a big uh, focus for SEG in the future. One thing that we haven't, uh, I think, uh, highlighted enough in the past is that one of the things that we do is building and facilitating a marketplace for technical exchange. Our exhibit floor is the prime example of this, right? This is really a marketplace for, uh, for geophysics, an exchange of technical uh, information. And finally, uh, we want to become known as the go-to source for information about applied geophysics. And I think uh, perhaps we're known as that uh, to a large extent in the geophysical community, but we can do that better. That's our the, the first sub-bullet there, connecting the world of applied geophysics. We also uh, would like to reach out and do a better job of uh, engaging other disciplines that are related to the work that we do, in geology and engineering in particular. Um, and finally, to the public at large, so this is something that we have not really done in the past, um, but it's something that we should be doing in the future uh, to help our organization and our profession uh, be more sustainable, to create new, uh, new job opportunities potentially for our members, um, reaching, out to the, reaching out to the general public and making sure that they know the value of the work that, uh, that we do in geophysics. So we would like anybody in the public, geologist, engineer, whoever, if they want to know something about applied geophysics, the first thing that comes in their head is SEG, and they come and, and look to us for that information. Okay, so what do we need to do to get there? So over on the right-hand side is where we, that would be your left-hand side, it's where we are today. So we are known for technical excellence. Uh, we do a lot of work with societal impact, um, but we need to do a better job of promoting that. Uh, and we're member-driven. Really, this is the core of SEG culture and why many of us are willing to devote our time and effort into helping SEG is that we really feel that we have an opportunity to to make things better and influence the organization. Uh, but we have sustainability issues that I'd mentioned. We have an aging membership. And as an organization, we have been slow to react to opportunities in the past. So what do we need to do to change? Well, we need a cohesive strategy, which we have now. We need to utilize that in our decision-making process uh, and be disciplined in that process. We need to improve our communications. We need to build a strong media presence uh, if we want to really make an impact uh, uh, in the world, and we need to develop uh, nimble processes in our administration. And as we've been going through this process this year and dealing with the finances, we find ourselves making a lot of, of uh, small adjustments in sort of a piecemeal fashion, and 
we've recognized that perhaps that's not the best way to go about it, and that perhaps we should take a step back, really think about uh, what the SEG is, what is our core, what's our core mission, what are our core values, and build out from there. So this year, uh, our new president-elect, uh, Bill Abriel, uh, who will be president on Thursday, <laughs> he's going to lead us through a process of trying to reimagine what SEG can be and uh, rebuilding around that uh, uh, core set of values and, and uh, programs that we have. With the goal, of course, to getting to the right-hand side of this, where we're viewed as the go-to uh, go uh, source for uh, information about geophysics, we're global, connected, and integrated, and as an organization, we're very agile and sustainable. At seg.org slash podcast, you will find all Seismic Sound Off episodes. SEG members, don't forget to renew your membership for 2017 at seg.org slash renew to take advantage of discounts on SEG books and ebooks like Dr. Vernick's Seismic Petrophysics and Jim Geyser's 3C Seismic and VSP. Please subscribe to Seismic Sound Off on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoy the show, review us on iTunes. The more reviews helps more people find our show and learn about the science. Season 1 of Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki, home to hundreds of biographies of key geoscientists, geophysical tutorials, and core content from the science of applied geophysics. Visit wiki.seg.org to learn how you can grow the world's first online geophysics encyclopedia. Original music by Zach Bridges. Special thanks to Kay Baker, Isaac Farley, and John Bradford for their support. Thank you to Freeman for recording. Remember, listeners, we want to hear from you. Why did you choose geophysics? What do you love about the science and the work you do? Email us at podcast at seg.org or leave a message today at country code 1-918-497-4627. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.